All right, hello church. I'm back again. For those of you who missed my introduction earlier, I am Jeremy Garland, the kids ministry director here at River Life. And because I'm teaching, kids are joining us today. And I forgot to have it mentioned that the nursery is open, but for self-serve. So if you need a quiet place for your, your little ones to go, the nursery is open for you. Um, so happy Mother's Day. Ironically, the last time that I, was, I preached was three years ago on Mother's Day. And I remember saying that it was the first, and depending on how well it went, possibly my last uh, sermon. Well, I stand here as a testament that it didn't go so poorly that I was never invited back, but it did take three years for everyone to forget, so I'm back. Um, all kidding aside, it's really a, it's a, it's humbling, and it's a privilege to be here on Mother's Day because moms are near and dear to me, because without you, I wouldn't have a job. And even more importantly, I had many amazing women in my life that taught me much of what it means to be nurturing and compassionate, especially to children. Uh, when it comes to amazing women, I have to look no further than my own mom uh, to learn everything that I need when it comes to nurturing and caring for anybody and everyone that will let her. So we often joke about my mom's cooking, not because it's bad, she's actually a really good cook, but because all of her recipes are made to feed the entire church. Uh, when I can't tell you how many times when we had people come over after church that were new to the church or were just having a bad day and needed some motherly love. So our door was kind of an open, it was an open door policy. We had people coming in and out all the time. Um, and she loves being hospitable. But something else that's important to know about my mom is that she loves the Bible. Even from a young age, she made it a value to memorize scripture and read her Bible often. How many of you are familiar with Bible cruising? Just a quick show of hands. That I didn't expect a whole lot, so I'm going to give you a quick breakdown. Bible quizzing is essentially, it's through the, the Christian Missionary Alliance, and it's meant for, uh, for kids ages 6th through 12th grade. And basically, they give you a set amount of scriptures. Say, for example, I did it once, and we had to memorize the entire book of Hebrews. But for each of our quiz meets, which were at once, uh, one Saturday every month, we had to memorize five chapters. So, for example, we memorized Hebrews 1 through 5. Um, and then we'd go and we'd answer questions on whatever it was we were able to memorize. So keep that in mind, because my mom was like the LeBron of quizzing. She was a five-time international all-star. Two times, two of those five times, she was top 10 in all of the United States and Canada. And she did only manage to win and become champion one time, so she didn't quite make it to Michael Jordan status, but even so, five-time international champion is pretty impressive, or five-time international all-star. Uh, she did, sorry, I skipped that. Um, so she cast a big shadow for those of us that are Bible quizzing amateurs, and for those of us who don't even know what Bible quizzing is. Um, but I, I come in my freshman year of high school, and I finally have the opportunity to join a quiz team. Uh, we moved back to Western PA, and if you don't know much about the Western PA District of the Alliance, Bible quizzing is by far, that's the largest place for Bible quizzing. So it was very much like a small fish in a big pond. Um, and my mom, she wanted to be the coach. So our church was ecstatic because they knew her credentials. They knew that she was a five-time all-star and a one-time champion. So they're ecstatic because she's the goat of Bible quizzing. So anyway, I, I joined the team, and I think I'm hot stuff because I know what the Bible is, and I've read some of it a couple of times. So I, th I think that, you know, I know what I'm doing. And there's just something about being a teenager. We just don't want to listen to our parents, even when we know their credentials. So I was a terrible student. I blew off all of my mom's advice and teaching, and I, I thought I had a better way of doing things. Well, it turns out our first Bible quiz, and I had no idea what I was doing. I don't remember exactly how well I did or how poorly I did, but I'm thinking it was probably embarrassing because I blocked it completely from my memory, and I have no idea what happened. But you know what? I did learn something important. I learned that my mom's way was a much better way. So here comes the super well thought out and not at all forced transition into today's topic, the disciples had someone even better than a five-time all-star and one-time champion. They had Jesus. He is the actual goat. And yet, they still couldn't figure out that, oh, can you switch to my slides? I didn't even pay attention to my screens. Oh, you did switch to my slides. My button's not on. All right. There we go. All right. So Jesus and only Jesus has the true way to live. So... Let me set up where we're at. So we are in the last year of Jesus' ministry on earth, 
and it's, it's a really rough year to say the least. Jesus and the disciples were anticipating the Passover celebration, but before the Passover celebration arrived, Jesus received word that his good friend Lazarus had died. This required a return back to Judea, to the town of Bethany, which was only two miles from Jerusalem. And this brought a fair amount of danger because there was a lot of plotting against Jesus, and all of his disciples knew this. Um, In fact, Thomas, one of the 12, who is often considered pessimistic and earned the title of Doubting Thomas later on in the story, actually encouraged the other disciples to follow Jesus. So he wasn't always a doubter. Uh, So let's see what he says in John John chapter 11, verse 16. But actually, before we get there, there's one thing that we practice downstairs with the kids. If you see a verse and it has red text, that's a verse that we all read together. So the black I will read and the red we'll all read together. So let's read. Then Thomas said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. So this, this is pretty bad. Thomas is expecting death as an outcome. But you know what? The disciples were ready to die with Jesus because they believed in him and they believed in his teachings. That faith would soon be put to the test. This return to Judea would actually be great news for Lazarus because Jesus raises him from the dead. But it also sets up a lot of plans that would eventually see Jesus arrested, beaten, and crucified. So the stage is set, sorry, the stage was about to be set for the salvation of the world, but Jesus wasn't done teaching and even warning the disciples what was still to come. Along the road to Jerusalem, Jesus told the disciples, we are going up to Jerusalem and the son of man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. On the third day, he will be raised to life. So this was not the first time that Jesus told the disciples that he was going to be killed. In fact, it's the third time that he told them. But like me in the earlier story, they thought they knew better. Then we get to the Passover itself where the bad news keeps on coming. He gives them a variety of of warnings that were yet to come. He told them once again that he is going to die. He said that Peter will deny him three times. One of the 12 is a traitor. Satan is gonna work against them at every opportunity and they are soon gonna be scattered. Understandably, disciples are discouraged and disheartened. Jesus knows the hearts of others and knew what the disciples were feeling at this moment, so he lets them in on his plan. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you, to be, uh, take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. So Thomas, returning to his pessimistic ways, is gonna be the first to speak up and he does speak for the rest of the group because they definitely don't understand what Jesus is saying when he says that they know where to go and how to get there. So Thomas says, Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and you have seen him. So this is the sixth of the seven I am statements. Let's take some time to break, down, uh, break this down so we can understand why Jesus and only Jesus has the true way to live. Although I am sure that you've already explored the meaning behind the two words I am in previous sermons, uh, we're going to get a refresher for those that usually frequent upstairs, and for those of us that are downstairs normally, this is going to be brand new information. So what is the significance of I am? I am had profound meaning in the original Greek, which is ego emi. One of the most simple ways to interpret this is I, myself, and only I am. Let me repeat that. I, myself, and only I am. For instance, like in my introduction, I said I am Jeremy. I can't use ego in me to announce myself because even though I am Jeremy, I'm not the only Jeremy in existence. In fact, I'm not even the only Jeremy that I know personally. So this simple two-word combination is reserved for a special person that exists 
all on their own. It goes even deeper. When Jesus uses this phrase, he is recalling an important moment in the history of the Israelites. He is making a callback to Exodus 3, when Moses first encounters God and learns his name. So imagine you're walking through a mostly barren landscape with some hills, a few plants, and occasional tree. Now imagine coming up on a bush that was on fire, but yet not, it wasn't actually burning and there wasn't even a smell of smoke. You might be curious enough to go investigate it. I know that I would be interested and go see, and Moses definitely was curious. So he approached it, and immediately he heard a voice coming from the direction of the bush. Then the bush says that it is God, and the ground is holy, so he has to remove his shoes. So Moses complies, and after a, a fair amount of conversation, the general idea is that God wants Moses to take his people out of captivity in Egypt into the promised land. But Moses is skeptical and not sure if he's qualified, and not sure if he really understands what God wants him to do, but he does ask a question that helps us understand God's personhood. Then Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am, and he said, Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. The story from Exodus and the meaning behind I am would have been common knowledge to any Jewish person. All of his disciples would have understood that using these words meant that there were deeper, deeper implications to what Jesus was saying. So that brings us to the most obvious question. What did Jesus mean when he said he was the way, the truth, and the life? So let's start with the way. Whenever I hear these two words, the nerd in me immediately goes to Star Wars, specifically to Mandalorian. Um, since Greg isn't here, I'm sure there's been a huge hole for Star Wars anecdotes, so I'm going to go ahead and jump headfirst into the Sarlacc pit. Um, so the Mandalorian, a.k.a. Din Djarin, is a bounty hunter that is well-respected and even feared throughout the galaxy. We find out that he hails from a world known as Mandalore, and there are many other Mandalorians that also work as bounty hunters and similar capacity work. So they're all well-trained warriors, and they adhere to a very strict uh, code of conduct. In one scene, Din Djarin has returned with a sizable portion of a very rare and even mystic metal known as Beskar. He takes it to the armorer to have a new set of armor made for himself, but he reserves a portion of it to be kept aside for the foundlings. That's the next generation of Mandalorians. The armorer appreciates this gift and declares that the foundlings are the future, and they recite the words, this is the way. This way that they speak of is an understood code that all Mandalorians must practice and pass on to next generations. Is it a code that they, it is a code that they live for and they die for. So does Jesus practice the way of the Mandalorian? Although Jesus does look pretty good in Mandalorian armor, and he does speak highly of children, he has an even better way. In fact, he is the way. So when Jesus says, I am the way, he intended for it to be both literal and figurative. He was continuing the previous statements from verses three and four. He was about to go to a place, his father's, uh, to a place, his father's house, to prepare a place for them to join him. Jesus told them that they knew the way to get to this place. The disciples did know this way because they knew him, and he is the way. This also signifies a path that must be followed. In Matthew 7, verse 14, Jesus teaches that this path is not easy to find and even harder to follow. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. And in contrast, Jesus also teaches that the road to destruction is wide and the gate is broad. But the path to life is much more difficult to walk than the path of, to death. So you might be asking yourself, why is the path to life so much more difficult? So let's use a simple Im illustration. Imagine there's a child in a room by themselves, and they are hungry. And on a table in the corner sits two bowls. In one small bowl is some broccoli. Very healthy, good for the child, but not very tasty. In another bowl, a larger bowl, there's a large helping of their favorite candy. You see where I'm going, right? Nine out of 10 kids are gonna choose the bowl with candy. But let's change it up. Let's imagine instead of broccoli and a candy and a child, it's you in the room. And on the table, there is a Bible and an iPad. Ask yourself honestly, am I choosing the word of God or am I choosing entertainment? Let me ask that again. 
Am I choosing the word of God or am I choosing entertainment? Jesus knows the heart and he knows most of us are picking the iPad. Let's go back to the way for a moment. Jesus in his infinite wisdom knew that we would have a hard time sticking to the path. So he left us a trail of breadcrumbs to help us on the way toward the way. He gave us the truth, which also happens to be himself. Peter tells us that we should follow in Jesus' steps. In verse 21 of 1 Peter chapter 2, it says, To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. Paul tells us to imitate Christ. In verse 1 of 1 Corinthians chapter 11, it says, Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. And John tells us, if we are Christians, then we shouldn't just talk the talk, but also walk the walk the way that Jesus did. In verse uh, 6 of John, 1 John chapter 2, it says, Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Jesus is the way because he is the truth. If we follow Jesus, then we stay on the narrow path. However, if we seek our own way, follow our own desires, then we end up on a much wider road. Now comes a question to hopefully encourage introspection and honesty. Am I becoming more like Jesus? This question can have some profound implications for you. Maybe you are certain that you still have a very long way to go. For some, you might still have to take the first steps towards starting a relationship with Jesus. For others, you might need a little help truly finding out where you stand. And in case you need a little extra help, here is one resource to give you a starting place. Go ahead and scan this QR code and take a look. I'll give you a few moments to bookmark it for later. You won't have time to do it now, but um, you'll need to create a free account, and then it takes seven to 10 minutes, and it asks 38 questions. But at the end of the 38 questions, they give you some areas for growth, and they even give you some resources on how to improve those areas. So finally, we get to Jesus' final words of that verse, the life. Jesus was asked on a few occasions about eternal life because it is a natural human desire to know what happens after death. Solomon even taught in his wisdom granted by God that God himself put eternity on our hearts. They say, or sorry, they, they, the people that heard that made flawed assumptions that a deed or good work must be made in order to earn eternal life, and they never considered that eternal life came from a person. Nicodemus, a Pharisee, went to visit Jesus late one night with a similar goal in mind. He wished to learn about Jesus and his power, but Jesus' answer was not what he expected. Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus was baffled by the idea that a person needed to be born again. Did Jesus mean that literally? And if so, how would that even work? Jesus didn't mean it literally, thank God. One birth is traumatic enough for everybody for the rest of their lives. But Jesus meant that they must be made new in their hearts and in their minds. He went on to tell Nicodemus in first, verse 15 that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. And he reiterates this in one of the most famous and profound verses in all of the Bible, one that I'm pretty sure we all know, but let's read it together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. I want to leave you with some encouragement. Seek Jesus. Figure out which path you are on and make sure you are following Jesus' steps. Don't assume that your way is the right way, especially if it doesn't line up with the truth that Jesus has demonstrated. It is my hope that all of us will be together in God's eternal kingdom one day. And it would be a shame if we got lost seeking our own desires. So remember, Jesus and only Jesus has the true way to live. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to have the ability to meet here as friends, family, and followers of Jesus. I pray that today would be a reminder of the path that you have set out before us. In our humility, give us guidance so that we may not stumble and fall away from you. If any obstacle comes before us, let us rely on you to give us strength to overcome. Help us to always seek after your face as we live and let our lives be testimony to all others that we truly believe in Jesus and follow his example. We love you, Lord, and in his name, in the name of Jesus, we pray these things for your glory alone. Amen.